Hello everyone, Stakui here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my hoes. Before it is that we begin today, I would just like to remind everyone that we have an upcoming trip here to Italy. And I will say this now, we had some last minute cancellations, which means there is actually still a few spots that are going to be left on the trip. So if you want to join us, if you want to have a fun adventure in Rome and see all the ancient Roman sites, make sure to click the link down in the description because my God, I cannot wait to go on an adventure with all of you. Also, if you guys don't mind, please make sure to leave us a review. It helps the podcast to grow and we love to hear what you think of the show. But in order to get into the meat of today's topic, I, okay, th th I'm just going to say this right now. This whole thing came as a suggestion from one of our viewers who presented this idea and I love it. Gabby, do you remember the show Family Feud? Yes. Okay. Of course. That show is something I didn't realize how old it is. It kind of makes sense because it's a very simplistic format. It's something that has been going on since 1976. And before anyone turns away from the podcast right now, no, we are not talking about the history of Family Feud. We are talking about the history of family feuds, like actual feuds between actual families. But he also has to tell you the history of family feud. Yes. Okay. That was completely <laughs> necessary. I did have to actually put this in here. Yes. The show first came about in 1976 and it entertained viewers by pitting two families against one another in a trivia based standoff for a cash prize. But in the centuries prior to that existing for cash, people would kill each other and then have to pay blood money prices to other family members. Yeah, that was something that usually ended up happening with long lasting repercussions. We need like a good old fashioned family feud, I think. What, what do you mean we need one? It would be way more interesting if there was just like good old fashioned family feud. I, I don't. Would you say World War II was a, or is it World War I? Was World a War family I. feud? World War I was a family feud between cousins, basically. Yeah, yes. that's what, you see, we need one. <laughs> I'm joking. No, see, I'm oh just joking. God. Yeah, we need another World War One. No, Absolutely. we just need a family feud. Maybe like a more low key one, kind of like the Kentucky case. The Kentucky, you mean the Hatfields and the McCoys? Whatever you want to call them. All right, I I would be doing a disservice right now if I did not at least mention the Hatfields and McCoys. I know that for a lot of people who are probably listening to this episode right now, they already know about it, and as a result, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But simultaneously, I know that if I skip this entirely, I'm going to get a bunch of people that are going to say and send us messages like, oh, I had no idea what this is. How dare you? Why did you skip this? So from that, I feel obligated that I do have to actually go and explain. Either way, I'm not going to give as much detail, but this is easily one of the most famous, if not the most famous cases of a family feud that would exist within the United States. Though I may be a little bit biased because this takes place in Kentucky and I am actually living in Kentucky. So this is something I feel a little bit more of a bond towards. A bond to a deadly family feud. Wow, that's, um, that's a lot to unpack. Just by, listen, okay, not much really happens around here in Kentucky, okay? Nothing really does. You know that very well, Didn't Gabby. Kentucky so we got to remember some things. Blue people? Oh, is that Tennessee? We, we did have the blue people, yes. And so that. apparently a lot happens in Kentucky. I wonder if I did a podcast episode that was like the most inbred families in history and what would actually pop up for that, because that is one of the members. Yes, that that would that would definitely be one of the things. But that is also probably something that I couldn't necessarily post onto YouTube. OK, getting into the whole story of what happened with the Hatfields and the McCoys before we go into a bunch of other stories about other family feuds that exist around the world. This is something that would completely wreck. Well, I don't even know how to put this in here. It would not wreck a dynasty because that's not the right word to say. This is something that would happen on a much lower level. So what would occur is that just 13 days after Asa Harmon McCoy would return to his Kentucky home in December of 1864, this guy gets murdered. And the culprits behind this murder, when this happens, is a group of pro-Confederate guerrillas that is led by a man named Jim Vance, who despised the McCoys for fighting in the Union Army during the Civil War. That is actually something that occurred all across the United States because there were many cir like circumstances in which you had families that tore themselves apart because some supported the Union and some supported the Confederacy, particularly in border states like Kentucky, Maryland, etc. That's where you would typically see that. To make matters worse, Vance was actually the cousin of a man who was known as the Devil Anne's Hatfield who was the head of the very prominent Hatfield family from neighborhood West Virginia. Unbeknownst to Vance, the murder is going to mark the exciting, the 
incredibly provocative. It's going to be the incredible incident that is going to lead to a decades-long feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys. The situation is only made worse and more complicated because the families were, despite how many of them may have disliked it, actually connected. Because, remember, we're talking about a place in the country where everyone is probably somewhat related to another distantly because you don't have nearly as large of a pool to be able to pull from, right? So they were actually related in a number of different ways. There was a man by the name of Bill Stanton, who technically at least was related to both families. So when he was called in as a witness, when the McCoys accused the Hatfields of stealing one of their pigs, his testimony was seen as being neutral because he was related to both families, right? Unfortunately, the judge was not. (laughs) Gabby, do you want to guess what family the judge may have belonged to? The other one? Yeah. Justice of the Peace, Anderson Hatfield, is the one who would ultimately rule over this thing and would rule in favor of his family. Of course. Yep. Wait, how would they even let that happen? Because the judge has a, he has a very obvious connection to the case. Well, remember, it's back in a time where not necessarily, there's not nearly as many people as well, right? So you have to travel further. It's not like it's a situation nowadays where you could hop in your car and just go over several counties. Like that is something that y- you have to deal with what you have locally. And everyone has local ties, right? So that's what ends up happening. Two years later, two McCoy sons would end up killing Stanton, the guy who had uh, testified against them for this perceived slight. And in the end, though, they would argue that they hadn't killed him to murder him. You know, they did it in self-defense. And when this happened, they managed to be acquitted of that murder. Then the saga would go and take another turn, something that is similar. Like if you're going to compare this to anything, I kid you not, this is straight up Romeo and Juliet. Check this out. You had Rosianna McCoy, who was Randolph McCoy's daughter, and Johns Hatfield, who was the son of that guy before, the Devil Anne's Hatfield. They fell in love, and they ran away together. Which really pissed off both families. The McCoys completely saw this as a betrayal, right? And they disowned Rosanna. But she actually came back to the family. She came back because, guess what? Johns was a bit of a piece of shit. He, um, he, he, he was a guy who was a, um, he had a bit of a women's problem. No, not a women's problem. He had problem. a woman problem. Um, well, <laughs> he had a problem with women, and that was that he couldn't seem to keep his hands off of them. He was a major womanizer, right? He was a guy who specifically slept around, and so Rosanna went and abandoned him. Johns does come back and tries to win Rosanna back, But that doesn't end up happening because the McCoys go and take him hostage, leading to the Hatfields to organize a rescue party to try and save him. They ambush the McCoys. They free Johns. And in the end, guess what? What? Johns goes and leaves her anyway. Reasonable. He spends the entire time trying to win her back and he ends up leaving her. But guess if you want drama, if you want anything, this sounds like something straight out of a really bad film. He leaves her. For her cousin, Nancy. What? Yes, he does. It'd be your own cousin. Yes. And at the time this happens. Wait, but she wanted to leave him though. Yes, she does. But he wins her back and then immediately abandons her, so to speak. That's too much. Somebody should write a movie on this. And well, there have been several. There have been movies. There have been TV shows. There have been everything. Like there actually has been. And to make matters worse, Rosanna was pregnant. Like does does that not sound like it's straight out of a drama? Like a really bad, like days of our lives, you know, when like oh they kill off the character and then it turns out the evil twin shows up. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Is yes. there an evil twin? That would just make the whole script pop. Yeah, that, that is essentially how that happens. And the whole thing ends up coming to a head on New Year's Eve, 1888, when Cap Hatfield and Jim Vance go and gather a party of Hatfield men and they set fire to the McCoy family cabin in the middle of the night. When the McCoys go and flee from their home, the Hatfields open fire, ultimately killing two of Randolph's children. This gets so bad that the governor of Kentucky eventually has to step in and dispatch Sheriff Frank Phillips to protect the McCoys. And working together, they devise a plan to kill Jim Vance. They capture a number of Hatfields who were ultimately sentenced to lengthy prison sentences, which after that, I mean, that pretty much ended the feud. There was literally nothing that they could do afterwards because all the men had been rounded up and thrown into prison. 
Imagine the governor having to get involved in your family fight. Yes. No, that is straight up what happened. Okay. The way people fight on next door, like, you know what next door is, right? Yeah. Like for the app that we would use for our neighborhood. Yeah. It connects your neighborhood. The way people fight on next door, I would not be surprised if a family feud breaks out because it is unhinged. Absolutely batshit. Oh, what, what was the worst one you've seen? I'm not going to expose the drama on here. Okay, I'm sure everyone is listening right now for the drama here, of course. <laughs> Without naming any names, obviously. Do you have anyone in specific? So there's like um, golf cart kids in our neighborhood. Like they let their teenagers ride around the neighborhood on golf carts. And that's illegal in our state and in our county and in our neighborhood. Like you're, you can't have an unlicensed minor driving a golf cart in the street. And one person in particular is really, really pissed at the golf cart kids and followed them home to their house one time. Oh, my God. I get I get the frustration with the golf cart kids because it is a safety issue, but it was a bit extreme. And then it kind of like spiraled. It, it was a fun time. I love reading the drama. Oh, my Lord. OK, well, speaking of drama. The next thing up on this list that we're going to be talking about is a Scottish feud, which I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. If we were going to be talking about anything with feuds, I could have made this entire list just composed of Scottish ones. Absolutely, I could have, because th this is pretty much what happens. Scottish were... people don't take this the wrong way, but every Scottish person that I have met, like they give the vibe of they would be involved in a bloody family feud. That's kind of what happens with clan based societies. You guys just have that vibe, the attitude, <laughs> and the accent. It sounds so <laughs> yes. lovely. And then if you get pissed, it's like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, right? Like when we're talking about a feud, there are very few things in this world that probably describe a feud as much as a Scottish clan. It really does. And so the example that I'm going to bring up from them, because again, I could have made this entire podcast literally just Scottish feuds. We're going to be talking about the McDonald Campbell feud and the Glencoe massacre. So many people still to this day believe that the massacre that took place at Glencoe in 1692, this had occurred specifically because of a feud that already existed, like a longstanding feud. But it's more complex than that, right? It is believed by many that the Campbells had decided to settle old scores by butchering their great rivals, the McDonald's, in cold blood, like for no reason. But the reality of the situation when we're talking about this is even worse because it's not just a family feud. It is horribly stupid politics that gets into it. Because yes, the Campbells were ruthless. They absolutely were. But they were mere pawns in another game, something more sinister, that something that was sanctioned by the king himself. So here's how this whole thing went down. The massacre that would occur was meant to be an act of punishment against the McDonald's for being, well, Bandits, basically, for, for not adhering to the rule of the king. They didn't want to accept the monarch's authority. But that ended up turning into a bloodthirsty excuse for some of the more powerful people in Scotland to just settle an old score that they had with the clan anyway and crush them, as well as anyone else that could potentially be rebellious among the Highland clans. So I'm going to set the stage here so you understand what I'm talking about. By the year 1691, William of Orange was now firmly on the throne of both Scotland and England. He was the guy who's in control. And the last Stuart monarch, the guy from before him, James VII and II, they were driven to exile in France. However, William wasn't entirely safe here, right? They still had a problem. See, if anyone knows the history of Scotland and the clans, they would understand that the Highland clans are traditionally very unruly. They don't exactly take kindly to people trying to order them to do things. And so when they had sworn an oath of allegiance to James, this was something that the king viewed as um, hindering his ability to actually trust them. So the king decided at this point that it was time for a showdown, right? And he was determined this was going to be one in which he was going to win. What it is that he would do is he would try to play a smart political game. He would decide to offer amnesty to any clan that had gone to battle for James, provided that they were going to swear an oath of allegiance to him before the 1st of January, 1692. And if they did not meet that deadline, their entire clan was liable for execution because they were deemed to be enemies of the state, right? However, William realized that his oath would have no meaning 
unless James was actually ready to release the clans from, you know, their sworn fealty to him. So he sent a message asking for the exiled former king to agree to this. And really enough, you'd think that a king at that point would have refused to just let what would happen happen. But no, James actually does go and accept the offer. But by the time that the ambassador got back to Edinburgh with the approval and word started being sent out to the Highland chiefs, guess what time it was? It was December 29th. It was three days before the deadline. Ooh, that's going to end well. Yeah, yeah. See, and here's a problem. We're not talking three days before the deadline in the modern day and age. This is something that is occurring in the late 1600s. They do not have the ability to travel around nearly as much as, you know, people do nowadays. So the McDonald's were one of the, like, most, they were one of the proudest. They were one of the fiercest. They were one of the big clans of the Highland clans. And they had supported James Jacobite cause. But their leader, Alexander McDonald, who was also known as McLean, he realized at this point that no matter how much their fervor, no matter how much they fought, no matter how much it is that they did, they weren't going to be able to win this fight. So he accepted reality and realized that he had to take the oath. Unfortunately, things didn't exactly work out for him because the whole thing turned into a comedy of errors. And this is going to sound so dumb when I explain this here because it's just one of those stories If you know how like a person who's trying to do the right thing, like if I said, oh my God, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to this event that I'm supposed to at four o'clock. But then on the way, I ran into a car accident. Then as I was almost there, uh, it turns out that my uh, tire went flat. And so I got stuck. So then I tried to get in. But then unfortunately, they closed the doors to the event 10 minutes early, despite the fact that I showed up because someone decided to lock it earlier to show up. Just all these weird, dumb little things that could happen. That pretty much happened to him. Because when he arrived at Fort William to swear his loyalty, he arrived just hours before the deadline on December 31st. He made it. But the local governor, Colonel John Hill, did not actually have the political authority to receive it. Meaning he could not do it there. He told McLean that the only civil magistrate in the district who was of the level that could actually take that oath was 74 miles away. And so McLean set off south immediately. And at this time, remember, it is December 31st. It is heading into midnight. It is about to be January 1st. And at the, this is Scotland. So and it is 74 freezing. miles away in what year? It's 1691. That's going to go well. Heading into 1692. Yes. Hopefully he has a really good car. Uh, nope. He is doing this. <laughs> he is doing it on foot and by horse pretty much. Yeah. In deep snow. In deep snow. Yes. And almost as soon as he sets out, or not as soon as he sets out, but along his way, he ends up getting arrested by a group of grenadiers, and he gets locked up for 24 hours. This is just going horribly. Yep. So by the time that he finally arrives at the location, it was January 2nd, right? The sheriff, Sir Colin Campbell, didn't return to work until the 5th, and initially, when he even got there, refused to accept the oath as the deadline has passed, though he would later actually relent to this. From all of this, when it's over, McLean, though he is nervous, finally believes that the problem is over and that his people are safe. But what he did not know was that everything was only just beginning for him. Because the certificate, the thing that was supposed to testify that the McDonald's had taken the oath, this gets sent to Edinburgh to the sheriff clerk, who, ironically, was also called Colin Campbell. The problem then became is that this guy, this Campbell, didn't like the McDonald's, right? He also, at the same time, didn't like it when things weren't done by the book. So to him, this unruly Scottish clan that he already had a beef with, that he really disliked, simultaneously was doing the worst thing imaginable for a British official, Gabby. He was breaching etiquette, and that simply wasn't to be done. And so as a result, he saw an opportunity that he could get back at the clan. So Campbell goes and scrubs the McDonald name off of the certificate. And then he passes, passes it over to the Scottish secretary, Sir John Dalrymple, who is the master of stare. Dalrymple's hatred of the Highland clans was intense, and at least it was as bad as Campbell's. And so he saw an opportunity from this to be able to strike at them and achieve vengeance. 
So Darren Poole very quickly decided that the McDonald's were going to be made an example of. And on, the Janu- on January 7th, he sent a letter to Sir Thomas Livingston, the commander in chief of the King's forces in Scotland, saying that he wanted action and even added in, and this is a quote directly from him, quote, I hope the soldiers will not trouble the government with prisoners. Well, that's lovely. Which means, yeah, they're, they're not sending anyone out there to arrest him. He's sending a message directly implying without outright stating, I want you to kill them. The order was then passed on to King William, who went and signed it because, you know, that was just a thing that obviously the clan did not meet the goal that he required. So that means that the whole thing was invalid. It's like they didn't actually give the oath in the first place. So they needed to be put out. Two companies of Argyle's regiments, totaling 120 men, were then ordered to proceed to Glencoe, where they were supposed to await further orders. The officer commanding them was another Campbell, Captain Robert Campbell of Glenian, who, mind you, if I'm going to add this in here, was an alcoholic that uh, had a particular grudge against the McDonald's of Glencoe since two years before they had left a trail of destruction as they passed through his estate on the way back from a battle. Because remember, England was going through a civil war here at this time, and it wasn't exactly a good situation. Okay, but who didn't have a grudge against the McDonald's? Pretty much it's the Scottish plans, Gabby. So everyone has a grudge against everyone else. I oh, kid great. you not. That is great. basically what happens. It sounds like a s- sorority. Yeah. It's giving sorority vibes. Correct. Yeah. Well, okay. Less of a sorority and more of a fraternity. I guess you could say this or what, what frat, frat boys are so nice to each other. What do you mean? And that kind of happened here. But the backstabbing is definitely something that you could probably expect from a sorority. Oh, wait, no, I'm getting ahead of myself here by possibly spoiling it. Anyway, moving on from that, when the troops arrived at the Glen, they told the unsuspecting McDonald's that they were there to collect taxes in the area, which is, you know, that's a thing that had to happen. You actually had to go out physically and meet these different clans in order to collect taxes. And they actually had papers with them that would prove their story, right? These weren't real. They were merely only there as a cover story. And so the tradition that Highland clans have at this time is that if someone comes to you, like in this case to collect taxes or anything else, if you have a guest, a visitor, you are supposed to show them hospitality. He was like the clan then offered to give the troops free board and lodging in the villages scattered along the Glen, and they took them in. For 12 days, the troops that were ordered to kill them would stay with them, enjoying their company. Glennian's own niece was actually married to one of the clan members, and he regularly would visit the pair for a drink. Then, the order to attack, which came directly from Darrenpool through Livingston, was passed on to the regiment. Glennian's orders were incredibly brutal, and they were very clear. They said, and I quote, You are hereby ordered to fall upon the rebels, the McDonald's of Glencoe, and put all to the sword under 70. You are to have a special care that the old fox and his sons do upon no account escape your hands. You are to secure all avenues that no man escapes. They were ready to crush them. The worst part about this entire thing is that the treachery, the deceit, all that, this was going to wait until the very last minute, and Glennian was fully prepared to deceive them, right? The evening before the attack, he actually played cards with the the sons of the chief, with Alexander and John MacDonald, and he even accepted an invitation from McLean himself to dine with him the next day. However, that was not going to actually happen. Because the assault would take place just as the orders stipulated at 5 a.m. on the morning of Saturday, February 13th. Men, women, and children were slaughtered as they lay in their beds. The attack would almost take all of the clan by surprise. McLean himself was shot twice as he tried to get out of bed, and he would fall dead in front of his wife, who was then stripped naked and thrown out of the house into the snowstorm. She would then later die of exposure the following day. The soldiers were not simply content to kill as many of the McDonald's as they could. No, they instead set light to the houses. They forced those who had not been murdered to flee into the hills. And their plan, though it was definitely simple, did still work. Because remember, this is the Scottish Highlands. And with the bitter cold weather, anyone who escaped from the bullet and the sword was very unlikely to survive outdoors for long. One by one, They would die of exposure in the mountains before they could ever reach the safety of shelter. In total, 38 people were murdered in their homes, with an unknown number dying in the snow. We just simply don't know. In addition to that, the clan would also lose some 1,500 cows and 500 horses, 
We don't even know the exact amount because everything was burnt. And as far as Darren was concerned, the massacre was a success. It had worked. Three weeks later, he described the slaughter as, quote, a great work of charity, like to put them out of their misery. And he said his only regret was that any of the McDonald's had gotten away. However, um, this is not something that is necessarily going to go over well with a lot of the public. And it very became clear soon that the, uh, the view that he had was, well, that was the minority one. The people didn't really appreciate it. All over the country, people reacted to the news with anger and horror. And as people became more and more angry as fury mounted, the king realized, oh, God, I screwed up. This is a major blunder. And so very quickly, what he tried to do, right? William, the new king that is in charge, tried to extricate himself from the mess by claiming, no, guys, I only signed the order because it was buried in a mass of other state papers. I hadn't actually really read it. <laughs> so he tried to st stop himself through that. Darren Poole, though, he couldn't get off the hook so easily. He was sacked from his post, and a commission of inquiry was established in order to investigate the entire affair. And he was the one who would end up taking most of the blame, though he would never actually end up being tried because his accusers knew that if this guy went to court, then the king would end up being complicit in what was happening. Like, there, there's no physical way that they'd be able to have him go to the stand and then not reveal everything else that had been done. So. Those who were involved in the entire business tried to deflect public opinion by claiming that the attack was a straightforward clan feud, something that would occur between the Campbells and the McDonald's on their own, and that it wasn't something that had actually been state sanctioned. And to an extent, they actually were successful. To this very day, when anyone talks about this stuff for clan feuds, when they talk about any of these things, many Scotsmen today believe that this was simply a battle between two rival groups that, you know, like blew up it got out of hand the real story of what actually happened with Lenko is so much more sinister because it involves so many more state actors that people are not aware of and from then on the mcdonald's and the other clans would forever harbor harbor a grudge towards the king and those who carried out the actions in his name their resentment would simmer until the jacobite rising of the 18th century which would then lead to everything turning into a full-scale rebellion against the crown which, Gabby, if you remember, uh, when we had seen things for um, uh, the, the oh God, why am I drawing the blank? Outlander. 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 That is literally when this thing takes place. And now that is something that also when I'm Wait, talking about this. Wait, which clan were they? I don't remember. Were they one of the clans? Were they they had to be, right? Because they were involved in that rebellion, weren't they? Can you look it up right now? I Actually, didn't watch very far into that. I think I watched I like one season, maybe not even the entire season. I got bored. I think it's been like two years since we actually went and watched it. Can you look that up right now? You're at your computer. Can you go ahead and just type in like the Outlander clan? Like what actually is the name? I can't remember if it was something that was made up or if it's based off the real clan. Well, I know her husband was a historian studying history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just a okay. weird coincidence. Two major clans in the series, the Mackenzie clan and the Fraser of Lovat clan. Okay. The Mackenzie clan is a real clan in Scotland and their ancestral home, Castle Liod, is widely considered to be Galvadon's inspiration for Castle Lioch, the home of the clan Mackenzie. I just got that from audible.com. That's the reference, okay? Okay, all right. Well, then that makes sense. That's, that's where that happens. But yeah, that would be the Jacobite Rebellion, which we definitely need to cover that here in the future because, oh Lord, was that thing a giant mess. But for now, we will need to move on to another topic. And speaking of clans, besides the Scots, there is another place where clans and blood feuds and clan-based war, well, that is something that was no more than a dime a dozen. I know. Hey, everyone, Sakuya here. And before we get back to the show, I would just like to thank today's sponsor, Rocket Money. For those of you who don't know what Rocket Money is, Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps to find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, to monitor your spending, to help lower your bills, and it does all of this in one place. I am saying this right now, but Rocket Money has been a huge help to my family. It is something that I have personally used for years, and over 5 million users have also been helped and saved an average of $720 a year. 
With all the different subscription services that I sign up to to get free trials to varying different things for news sites and other organizations that I need in order to do research for this show, it is very quickly and easily going to get out of hand for me. And there have been multiple occasions where I have accidentally paid for additional subscriptions for things that I end up not needing. And Rocket Money has thus been able to save me and catch this and stop me from overspending. In addition to all of that, easily one of the most valuable aspects that my family uses and my wife really drills into me what it is that she needs is the ability to budget our finances, and that is something that Rocket Money has helped us immensely with. So I'm saying this right now. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash everything. That is rocketmoney.com slash everything. Where? Japan. Yes, you know it. How many times have I talked about anything with all the clans and the daimyos and all the varying family feuds that would break out? Didn't they have your of or the single could you die? There you go. Yes, that is true. Everything that we could talk about with feuds and with clans and with everything, the single could you die is literally the age of war. It is a period of a hundred years in which every clan was fighting each other for power, prestige, and territory. And you can imagine during that time period that there is a ton of blood feuds that would arise during this time period. And the feud that we're going to be talking about today, though, with that is the story of the 47 Ronin. Why does that sound super familiar? Hey, Gabby, I want you to look up something right now. You're at your computer. I want you to type in the words 47 Ronin, Keanu Reeves. Just, just go ahead. Just go ahead. Tell me what it is that you see. Oh, a movie. <laughs> yeah. Wait, was he... Was he Japanese? No. Nope. Is Keanu Reeves Japanese? Nope. Was he a Japanese character in the movie? No, no, not exactly. He was a foreigner in that, but they called him the Tengu, which is like the, the long nose one. Um, His nose is pretty long. Yeah, and there's a whole thing that's specifically for phenotypes and difference between races that Japanese people typically have smaller, a little bit more pushed in noses, while Europeans, if you've ever seen like, if you've ever seen any kind of depiction of white people in anime one of the stereotypes that they'll put is having like a more prominent nose and also the blonde the blonde yeah the blonde the blonde, here. Yes, like absolutely. every american character is so blonde like golden blonde yeah yeah that does end up happening it very makes no sense yeah it's 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 fascinating i love it ah also might be wearing an american flag yes it's true i love anime it's, it's true it's very true but I mean, then again, it's Americans. <laughs> I think we might be wearing an American flag. Yeah, you know, that is also true. I actually did that when I studied abroad there first when I was uh, when I was like 19. I had Steven, several shirts were, that had American flags on. Them. You were feeding the stereotype. Now they're going to think of you next time and be like, yeah, it was true. Good. They do wear American flags. Absolutely good. Yes, I'm, I'm glad. Be the American that the Japanese imagine you to be. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, besides the movie with the whole thing with the Keanu Reeves and 47 Ronin, which was actually a pretty good movie. That was an interesting fantasy take on the whole thing. That is just one example of many different series, many different shows, many different movies, plays, books, whatever, all that are based off the original story of the 47 Ronin. Because I kid you not, this is literally one of the most famous stories in all of Japanese history. And mind you, it is a true story. Like the details that we're talking about here sounds like it's something straight out of a drama, much in the same way as the Hatfields and McCoy, but it is real. During the Tokugawa era in Japan, the country was ruled by the Shogun, which remember we talked about that in the Sengoku Jidai. This was the highest military official, and they ruled in the name of the emperor. And under them, under the Shogun, was a number of regional lords, the Daimyo, each of whom would employ a contingent of samurai warriors. Now, all of these military elites were expected to follow the Code of Bushido, which is the way of the warrior. And one of the demands of Bushido was loyalty to your master, absolutely, and fearlessness in the face of death. So if you lost your master, one of the customs, and we're going to talk about this here in a second, is that you are supposed to follow them into the afterlife, right? Like, let's say that it's in the age of war and your commander gets cut down in, in the field of battle and there's no more heirs to the clan that you would be serving, then your custom at that point is to literally kill yourself. Which is not, not, not conducive to actually being able to do much in a war. <laughs> because imagine if every time you lost a battle, you lost all your troops because they ended themselves before they could actually reform in order to be able to fight again. It seems like a little bit of a contradiction. 
Anyway, in 1701, the Emperor Higashiyama sent imperial envoys from his seat at Kyoto to the shogun's court at Edo in Tokyo. A high shogunate official, Kira Yoshinaka, served as master of ceremonies for the visit. And two young daimyos that were there, Asano Naganori and Ako and Kemisama of Tsumono, were in the capital performing their alternate attendance duties, where, you know, you had to spend part of your time in the capital and part of your time in your domain. So the shogunate gave them the task of looking after the emperor's envoys. Kira was then assigned to train the daimyo in court etiquette so that they didn't embarrass themselves. And Asano and Enkame offered gifts to Kira as was custom, which, Gabby, that essentially meant that they had to bribe the guy. Like, I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Like, straight up, what was supposed to happen is, similar to what you explained for uh, when someone had to do their job back in Trinidad, like in the case of putting in the, the water at one of the houses, that they would be paid by the state, and then you actually had to bribe them to do their job to put pipes in your house. It was custom to essentially bribe these officials to do their job well for you, to teach you these things. But what would end up happening here is that the gifts that they gave, the official considered them to be totally inadequate. And he was angry. He was furious. And he began to treat the two daimyos with contempt, to insult them, to belittle them, to not actually help them. Kame was so angry about this, about the humiliating treatment, that he wanted to kill Kira. But Asano, Asano didn't want to do this. He preached patience. because. This was something that could only end horribly. And feel fearful for their lord, Kame's retainers actually did something behind his back. They secretly went and paid Kira a large sum of money as a bribe, and so the official began to treat Kame better, but Asano's people didn't do that. And so Asano continued to be tormented until the young daimyo couldn't endure it, and after he was insulted one final time, when Kira reportedly called him a country bumpkin without manners, apparently in the main hall, Asano would draw his blade, and he attacked the official. Even though when this would happen, Kira would only suffer a shallow wound to his head, the issue became is that the shogunate law, right, this strictly forbade anyone from drawing a sword within Edo Castle. And so the 34-year-old Asano was ordered to commit seppuku and end his own life. Five days later, Asano's retainers and Akko would hear of the terrible news, and they would hold a meeting to try and determine what needed to be done. Because the issue was that without a lord, the shogunate would end up confiscating their domain. And the men had unwittingly become ronin, which are samurai that don't actually have a master to serve. A number of options were considered, including fighting back or just committing seppuku at the castle gates to retain some of their honor. But there was one among them that actually urged a degree of caution. Oishi Yoshio. Oishi's words ended up being heated, and the castle was surrendered on May 26th. They did not actually fight back. After Asano's death, the shogunate would go and confiscate his domain, which would leave his family impoverished, and the samurai that served it reduced to the status of ronin. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, ordinarily what was ha supposed to happen is that samurai were expected to follow their master into death rather than face the dishonor of being a masterless samurai. But for 47 of Asano's 320 warriors, those individuals would decide to remain alive and instead seek revenge. So led by Oisho Yoshio, the 47 ronin would swear a secret oath to kill Kira at any cost. And fearful of just such a thing actually happening, Kira went and fortified his home and posted a large number of guards so that he would be able to stop whatever potentially was coming after him. The Akko ronin, though, they weren't eager to have things happen now. Instead, they bided their time, waiting for his vigilance to relax. To help put him off guard, the ronin would scatter to different domains. You know, it's not exactly a good idea to have a bunch of armed men that are close by in a group because this is something that is seen as a threat. So they scatter to nearby domains, taking menial jobs as merchants or laborers or anything that they could to pass the time. One of them even went and married into the family that had actually built Kira's mansion so that he could have access to the blueprints. They were planning ahead. Oishi himself began to drink and spend heavily on prostitutes, doing whatever it is that he could to give a very convincing image, an imitation of a completely debased man, someone who was just losing himself to, well, the opposite of the samurai way, if you will. Yes, like the women. He was losing himself to 
Oh my no, literally, that's what it is. Like he becomes a drunkard womanizer. That's the whole thing. Like he he becomes something that is contemptible. No samurai views him as a legit samurai at this point. Did he? Was he actually drinking? Was he acting? Yes. No. He was doing both. He was actually doing the thing. Interesting. It's like the equivalent of, you know, how some people in order to uh, get to a secret club or something have to sacrifice something like you'd see. Oh, yeah. Prove your loyalty to me by cutting off your hand. And then he like someone would do that or whatever. What? OK, we're talking about assassins or something at that point. All right. Just think about it in so that way. You know that there are assassins and not movies who had to prove their loyalty by cutting off their hand. And you didn't just get that from the movie. With Keanu Reeves. God, oh, what is the name of it? John Wick. John Wick. <laughs> that was a finger. Okay. But, okay. But um, tell me that you have actual proof of this. I just use just... that as an example. They right, did, right. No, here's right. the thing. They didn't usually use something as like a, as a, uh, as a full hand. Typically what would happen is that actual You're orders pinky. when they have this would use, yeah, they would use like a finger or what they would end up using is a tattoo, something that would actually physically mark them. A brand. Yeah, a brand. I would just brand people if I were like a mob boss. I feel like it'd be really fun. Not to like act. Fun? That, well, that came out wrong. <laughs> fun. I mean, like, a, not like fun as in yay, fun, but fun as in like when you paint your room yellow, you know? And you're comparing that to a mob. No, just a branding. A, br- a brand. It's like a more hardcore tattoo. That's what I mean. Like, it's fun. It's different. You're quirky. You're quirky. It could be a quirky mob boss. <laughs> okay. Um, James, you can cut you can you could cut that out. Okay. A little bit of unhinged commentary. Cut okay. it out. Well, to answer your question there, Gabby, yeah, he did all the things that uh people thought that he was. He was actually heavily drinking. He was actually womanizing. He was actually doing all this stuff because he needed to convince people that he had completely lost himself. But that wasn't true. Even then, one of the incidents that reportedly happened during this time period is that a samurai from the Satsuma province apparently recognized him laying on the street when he was drunk, who then proceeded to mock him and kick him in the face, which is a complete mark of contempt, right? Reasonable. Then the incident was actually going to occur. Oishi was prepared at this point. He went and divorced his wife, and he sent his younger children away in order to try and protect them. Because his plan was going to come into fruition and he knew, he knew that there was very little chance that he was going to survive. So he needed to distance himself from his family as much as possible so that they didn't also get caught up in it. However, his oldest son chose to stay with him. And so as the snow sifted down on the evening of December 14th, 1702, which I don't know why all the stories that we're talking about start in December for whatever reason, but they do, the 47 Ronin would meet once again at Honjo near Edo and prepare for their attack. One young ronin was assigned to go to Akko and tell their tale for what had actually happened in case they failed. The 46 would first warn Kira's neighbors about their intentions, and then from there, they would surround the official's house armed with ladders, battering rams, and swords. And silently, some of them went and scaled the walls of the mansion and then overpowered and tied up some of the night watchmen. At a drummer's signal, the ronin would attack from the front and rear, And Kira's samurai were completely caught asleep and they rushed out to fight shoeless in the snow. They had no idea what was going on. They had no shoes? They had no shoes. They had no nothing. They were in their underwear. Or did they just like not put their shoes on? Because I feel like you could just take two seconds to slip your boots on and then go out into the snow. I feel like it would help you. No, they literally just ran out. They didn't have any shoes. Many of them were in their underwear. Okay. I get not putting on a full like outfit, right? But shoes... Nope. You got some slippers by the door to Japan. Nope. So that's what happened. And in fact, Kira himself, the main target that we're talking about here, he was in his underwear and ran outside to try and hide in a storage shed. Did it work? Initially. The Ronin would search the house for over an hour and eventually would discover him hiding in a heap of coal inside of the shed. That's so embarrassing. Yeah. The way they were able to recognize him from this is that the guy has a scar on top of his head. Because remember, from the beginning, their master had cut him in his head and it was a shallow cut. That scar was still there. And so when this happened, Oishi didn't actually try to kill him first. Instead, he got on his knees and he offered Kira the same wakizashi, the short blade, the thing that is typically used traditionally to commit seppuku, that Asano, his master, had used to commit seppuku. And he asked the official to please use it. 
But he soon realized that Kira didn't actually have the courage to end himself, at least, you know, with the whole Japanese sense of honor. And the official really showed no desire whatsoever to end his own life. So Oishi very quickly just turned around and beheaded him. The Ronin would reassemble in the, main, in the mansion's courtyard, and all 46 of them were alive. Not a single one had fallen. They had killed as many as 40 of Kira's samurai at the cost of only four of them being wounded. And at daybreak, the Ronin would walk through the town of the Sengakuji Temple, where their lord was buried, and the story of their revenge spread rapidly everywhere, to the point that crowds were gathering along the way as they marched to their master's grave, cheering them on. Oishi would wash the blood from Kira's head and presented it at Asuna's grave. And the 46 Ronin, do you know what they did at that point? Hung out? They just hung out. They sat down and they waited to be arrested. Wait, why are they getting arrested? Because they were doing the honorable thing. They fought for their honor. They fought for their vengeance. They did this. And from there, they decided that they had met their goal. They did what they needed to do. But in order to meet their goal and achieve their honor, they had violated the law. And so while the Bakufu, the military government, decided their fate, the Ronin would end up being divided into four different groups and were housed by varying different daimyo families. We're talking about major ones like the Hosokawa, the Mari, the Mizuno, and the Matsudaira families. The Ronin were effectively national heroes here because they had adhered to Bushido. They were incredibly brave. They had showed loyalty and honor, and many people hoped that they would be freed, given a pardon. But no. Although the shogun was tempted to grant clemency, his counselors could not condone an illegal action like they had done. You couldn't just kill an official of the government, even if that government official was a corrupt asshole. Like you couldn't do it. <laughs> there should have been a law that was like, you can, you know, if the official is a corrupt asshole. Like that should have been a clause in their law. Nope. Doesn't work like that, especially now with how strictly they had to adhere to it all. And so on the 4th of February, 1703, the Ronin were ordered to commit seppuku, which was deemed to be a more honorable sentence than just being executed, because that's what it was in the Japanese eyes. Hoping for a last-minute reprieve, the four daimyos who had custody of the Ronin waited until nightfall, but there was no pardon. And so the 46th Ronin, including Oishi, and his 16-year-old son, would all end their own life. The Ronin were then buried with their master at the Sengukuchi Temple in Tokyo. And their graves instantly, like, became a site of pilgrimage. This was something that was incredibly famous for the Japanese. And still to this day, people go there to actually see them. It is a massive thing. We well, didn't go there. Like, no, we didn't, actually. That's one of the things that we could have gone to and we didn't. Okay, when we go back next year, that's what we're doing. Yep. And apparently, as the story goes, one of the things that happened is, remember that Satsuma samurai that we talked about in the beginning that had kicked Oishi in the head? Yes. Reportedly, that same samurai showed up to his grave, apologized, and then killed himself right there as an apology. They are a little bit, um, don't take this the wrong way, gung-ho about the uh, seppuku. Yeah, yeah. Now, some of the aspects of the story may be exaggerated, but the general circumstances that I've talked about are, like, th th that, that, that is the story. That is the accepted thing for what, what did, in fact, happen. And the fate of... The 47th Ronin, that last young one that was sent away, we don't really know. There's many sources that say that he returned, like, from telling the tale at the Ronin's home domain of Akko, and the Shogun would end up pardoning him because, you know, he was this young kid, he was a youth, and that he apparently then lived to a ripe old age and was buried alongside the others. But others say that he died, and others say that he just disappeared. We don't know. Either way, to help calm public outrage over the sentence that was handed down to the Ronin because the Shogun had realized that this was going to be a huge popular movement, the government would end up returning the title of, you know, like the daimyo and one-tenth of Asuno's land to his eldest son. So at least he would get something. Which is not a perfect standard, or a perfect ending by the standard of many Western audiences, but to the Japanese, this would become a legendary story something that would be adapted into many plays and a ton of artwork that still persists to this day, which is why I told you to look up that thing about Keanu Reeves and the 47 Ronin. But does it really count as a family feud? It sort of does. Here's the thing. It's clans. It's a feud. It's what happens with this. Yeah, but were they blood related? 
Um, How are we defining family in this episode? Hold on. It, it doesn't matter that they were related. What it's matters is that there was a feud, feud between families. No. We didn't call it clan feud. It was feuds. No. Okay. Do you think... The, Historical feuds is the title of this. the award-winning game show Family Feud would let a non-family onto the show? They might have. They might have. I don't know. Okay, fine. You want a real family feud? You want something that is literally just clans versus clans and trying to wipe each other out to a last man? No. <laughs> is that what you want, Gabby? Is that what you want? Not particularly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I contemplated when creating this episode was I thought about talking about the Hutus and the Tutsis. I thought about doing that. But so many people have heard about the story of what happened there in Rwanda. And that is also probably something that deserves its own episode. No. Okay. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to move across the water, and we're going to talk about another major feud, something that would break out in China. Oh, no. Yep. And you know what happens whenever you talk about a conflict in China? Everyone gets mad at you? Everyone gets mad at me, and millions of people die. Not now. I'm talking about in the event that we're talking about here, because that's literally what goes down. Yeah. You, it's like one of those things that you talk about with anything in Chinese history is like, ah, oh, yes, so-and-so uh, besieged this city in the year of whatever the emperor. Uh, casualties, 3.1 million. Okay, I just never... What was it? Wasn't they war with Jesus's brother? Oh. Insane. Yes, Gabby, that's because a Because a lot of people died. Yes. And I was looking at this and I was like, yeah, probably like 2,000. And it was an unhinged number. More people than World War I died over the course of the Taiping Rebellion. Yes. And that blows my mind. I, it makes sense. There's a lot of people that are options that, you know, there's, there's more people that could die, but yep. that doesn't mean they should. And I think they need to remember that when they do rebellions. And that is actually related to the very thing that we're talking about here, because this takes place at around the same time period. We're talking about the Punti Haka clan wars, which that guy, uh, Hong Shu Quan, right? He was the individual that ended up leading stuff for the Taiping rebellion. He was an ethnic Hakka. That, that he was. Define ethnic Hakka. Okay, so Hakka, I'm going to need to kind of explain this here. So the Punti and the Hakka are two different ethnic groups within China. China has thousands of different ethnic groups, with only some of them being major ones. And the Hakka are one of these, which their name means something like the guests, right? Because they were a people that over time, over the past like thousand odd years, started in the north and steadily would migrate south. Okay, so like guest families? Yes, it's kind of what their name would mean or come to mean, right? And so the Hakka and the Cantonese people in Guangdong, which were the Punti there, they would end up fighting between 1855 and 1867. And this was incredibly fierce fighting, mostly concentrated around the Pearl River Delta, especially in Toishan and the Zeyuk counties. The war that we're about to talk about here, or the war, since it's actually a series of little conflicts, would result in roughly a million people dying and many more civilians being displaced. It's going to get bad. So, okay, first off, the cause of the war and what exactly happened in here. I've talked a little bit about Chinese history and like the Ming, the Qing, the all the other varying dynasties and clans. During the early years of the Qing's conquest of the Ming dynasty in the 17th century, there were a number of Ming supporters that had fled to the island of Taiwan, right? This is very important for me to specify this in the first place. They initially did what the actual, like in the modern day, where you have Taiwan now with the, uh, with the Republic of China versus the People's Republic of China. They tried to do the same thing, and there they tried to bide their strength to retake the mainland. The Shunxi emperor, fearing that the coastal people of what is now the Guangdong province would actually help the rebels, he ordered them to do something of what is called now the Great Clearance. And this, this exemplifies the sheer strength and power of the Chinese emperor. So get this right. The Great Clearance was a time in which the Chinese people living in that area were ordered to destroy their property and move it some 25 to 30 kilometers inland. And if you did not do this, the punishment was death. This is like, I want you to imagine this, that there's a border war that is going on between Kentucky and Ohio, and there's all these people that are living in, like, let's say that all the people of northern Kentucky, just south of the river, live like they are native Ohioans or whatever. And so the governor of Kentucky fears that they're going to help the people of Ohio retake the territory or whatever. So he orders every person living on the coast of that river to move 30 kilometers south of it, which is absolutely insane. 
and it would take nearly 50 years. But the rebels that we're talking about here on the Taiwan Island were eventually pacified. But the strip of land that was completely empty on Guangdong's coast, that is something that very few people would end up actually live in for a very long time, right? Very few of the former population would ever return to it. And considering what it is that we're talking about here, it, it completely makes sense as to why. So the Guangdong governor wanted to try and repopulate the area with, or not that specific spot, but the territory that remained in the province. And in order to get people to actually move to the area that they could, they tried to offer land and silver to people that were typically poorer from more overpopulated areas that were concentrated in the cities. And that is a really good deal for landless poor peasants with very little opportunity. And there were many different people that took them up on this offer. Like, it's a great thing for, for that to happen, right? One of the biggest groups to go and accept this offer were the Hakka, which that is a ethnic group that is one of the things that is related to the Han, which is the main ethnic group within China. Hakka does mean guest or stranger, and they were from the north, but over the time had migrated across varying regions of China. The Hakka absolutely wanted to settle at Guangdong, and they leapt at the chance to do so. But as it turns out, other people had gotten there first. And so most of the land that was actually fertile and good for growing crops, that was occupied. And the locals spoke a different dialect, but they were descendants of the earlier people that had lived in Guangdong. They were individuals who were referred to as the Punti, meaning people of the earth. And so since fertile lands were, you know, already taken, there was nothing they could really do. The Hakka didn't really have much choice. They had the poorer, inferior, mountainous land to try and cultivate. And many of them had never had any land at all before, so they didn't really know what to do. And as a result, many of these individuals ended up having to serve as debt slaves on Punti-owned farms. Sharecroppers. Sometimes these debts were so large that entire generations of Hakka ended up having to work on a single farm and never moved from that point. Wow. I, I, I kid you not, if you want to compare this to anything, Gabby, remember when we've talked about stuff with American history and what happened after the Civil War? Yeah. Like, so when it comes to all those plantations, the former slaves that after they were freed, many of them had literally no opportunities. The only thing that they knew how to do was farm and they weren't given their own land. Yeah, there are 40 acres and a mule, like one of the big things that was promised. So many... Wait, they weren't given that? Some were. Majority were not. Huh. That did not happen for the majority. So what ended up happening then is that they had to, many of them had to go back to their former masters and work on the plantations again as sharecroppers. That's so interesting because in Trinidad, back home, where I grew up, we learned that they were given land because like when, you know, in Trinidad, everybody kind of got land, I guess. And, you know, some were. That's the thing. In America, some were. But after Lincoln was you know, assassinated and the next administration comes into being, the guy in charge there wasn't exactly keen on working with freed slaves. Um, he pissed off a lot of people, just to say the least. We could probably do an entire episode dedicated to that with what happened with the uh, the Gilded Age that would follow afterwards. So was their farming setup similar to what they had going on in, what was it, Russia? As serfs? You could almost say that here. But yeah, they, but they weren't actually owned, like the land wasn't owned, sort of. They, or not, they weren't bound to the land necessarily. They just had to stay. Yes, because of a debt. So technically speaking, if they could pay off the debt, they could leave. They weren't legally bound to the land. Many of them ultimately ended up being, which meant that it pretty much was similar to slavery. Yeah. The thing is, though, the Hakka would continue to grow in the area. And over time, these groups would start to band together, much in the same way as what happens in many different places with ethnic minorities moving into cities and then creating their own ethnic enclaves, like the Irish and the Italians in New York, or like the Koreans and the Chinese in places like San Diego, etc. And soon enough, they were creating these conclaves all across the Guangdong province, practicing their culture, speaking their language, owning their own land. The Punti landowners, in the beginning when all this was going down, they were at first happy to use the cheap labor that would come in from the Hakka. That was fine. But now as more and more and more and more of them were coming in, they were starting to get a little bit nervous. Because they knew that if a large enough number of the Hakka came in and started putting down their roots for good then potentially the Hakka could just decide to take things over by force. Now, 
That all being said, it's not just the landowners that we're talking about here. Punti peasants, the regular people who did not own land, they had to work the land as well. They saw the Hakka as labor competitors, much in the same way as when you talk about uh, Irishmen, like poor Irish immigrants competing with freed former slaves after the American Civil War in New York. I'm going to compare that a lot here because it really is actually similar. The, the Hakka were taking their potential job opportunities. And they didn't take kindly to this, and that really pissed them off, which led to some ethnic strife. The two groups began to align against each other, and tensions started to grow worse, especially as the population of the Hakka grew to be around 30% of the overall population. But for about 100 years or so, the Qing government was still strong, and they had a strong presence, meaning that even if the tensions existed, nothing was going to happen that was going to cause it to boil into conflict. Until another thing boiled into conflict. Of course. You remember how you talked about the guy who believed that he was the brother of Jesus Christ? Yes. Yeah. The Taiping Rebellion set this whole thing off. See, the Taiping Rebellion was going to be the spark that set off the firestorm because Hong Shu Quan was the individual that we're talking about here who believed that he was the brother of Jesus Christ. And he raised a massive army in the Guangxi province and try to overthrow the entirety of like the Chinese government of the Qing dynasty. The Taiping Rebellion was so bad, it weakened the Qing so badly and their control over Guangdong that the government simply could not maintain troops there. They couldn't actually do anything. And because the Taiping Rebellion was inciting other rebellions and conflicts across China, this meant that they could hardly afford to keep any troops there to govern things at all. One of these was the Red Turban Rebellion, which would spark a conflict throughout Guangdong, and the local Qing government, unable to keep the peace with their own troops, did something very fateful. They asked the Hakka in August of 1854 to help to raise their own military militia to battle the bandits, which the bandits at the time were mostly ethnic Punti people. And so after some initial successes in suppressing the Red Turban Army bandits, a Hakka by the name of Ma Konglong proposed to the Guangdong governor, Ye Minchen, that he put together an army of Hakkas from six counties to go and suppress the bandits for good. Ye gave Ma Konglong his permission to do so, and Ma's army would then go and raid and enter several Punti villages along Guangdong. The issue was he wasn't a military commander. He wasn't an actual leader. He couldn't control his army, and the Hakka militia then degraded to looting and torching, burning, and killing anyone they could find. The Punti landowners saw the Hakka army as being just an attempt to try and seize and destroy their property, and they immediately formed their own militias and built forts and got mercenaries to try and get revenge for their own villages, and then they would do the same back. This would effectively spiral into a massive maelstrom of violence, something that would continue on for years. The violence that was inflicted upon the Hakka by these reprisal attacks by the Punti would then cause the Hakka, who were not actually involved in the conflict, who were working under the Punti, to stop working the land in protest and stop paying rent to their Punti landowners. Those landowners would in turn have to turn to the poor Punti peasants and recruit them and then try and get revenge upon the Hakka and seize their land. Hakka people all across the region were seeing their villages burned down to the ground. And when this would happen, they would retreat to the mountains in the forest of Guangdong. There, they would join up with other Hakka armies and without any kind of source of food, because remember, it's the mountains, they literally can't produce anything. They then had to supply themselves by looting and sacking nearby cities. Which, as you can imagine, is only going to continue the cycle of violence. At first, the Qing actually tried to stop the conflict. They tried to mediate peace talks between the clans. But then the Second Opium War broke out in 1857, and the Qing government had to completely withdraw because now they had to deal with the Europeans as well as the Taiping Rebellion. The Hakka Punti clan wars would go on for years with clan against clan killing each other. And it would finally end with the Qing being able to reunify and applying all of the horrible ferocity and bloody ruthlessness, ruthlessness that they were known for. In 1863, a group of some 200,000 bandits living on what is now Bayun Mountain, who were hungry and desperate, descended upon the city of Guanghai and sacked it and took the governor hostage. Guanghai at this time was a critical military fortress called Guanghai Walled City, and the Qing government 
was not going to have any of this. This was, was no longer just a bunch of farmers killing a bunch of other farmers. They had sacked a major military encampment in the city. And as a result, the Qing would launch a brutal military campaign to put down both the Hakka and the Punti. And this was going to be a hard thing to solve. They weren't really going to be able to end the violence because both sides wanted each other dead. So they did something, I'm not going to say unprecedented because China has done stuff like this here before, but you remember what happened when the Jews revolted against the Romans? How they kicked them out of, the, out of Israel? Yes. Well, pretty much that is what China did here. The Hakka were completely removed from the territory. They tried to remove as many ethnic people like ethnic Hakkas as they could from Guangdong and distribute them around other provinces. And the remaining Punti were allowed to keep their land, but the devastation of years of warfare had destroyed them so badly that they were going to live in poverty for many years after, with many thousands of them having nothing and being forced to flee and emigrate to places like Singapore, the United States, Australia, etc. That's actually where a number of railroad workers in the United States ended up coming from is from refugees who had lost everything. As a result of this, anywhere between 500,000 to a million people would die over the span of this like 15 to 20 years. And that is the Hakka Punti clan war. If you want more information on that particular one, since before doing research for this, it's the first time that I had actually heard of this co on conflict, there is a channel called Asianometry on YouTube that for anyone watching this, I would also highly recommend that you check out because it's really cool. And a large amount of the information I have for this last part came directly from that channel. It is incredibly good. But my friends, that is the story of several feuds, horrible, bloody feuds throughout history. And if you want to learn more, then by all means, do some of your own research and listen to other episodes of our podcast. My friends, thank you very much for listening. This has been Stakuyi with the History of Everything podcast. I will see you all next time. Goodbye, my friends. Bye.